death sentence has been declared on these drab terrace houses built some 50 years or more ago. Soon, the last of them will come down and be replaced by blocks of modern flats separated by neat patches of grass and trees. Glass, steel, brick and concrete joined into giant units by men of vision applying modern methods of construction. All this is being brought about by new methods of building and in the reshaping of our cities, the Babcock Vites tower crane has an important part to play. A new sports stadium at Crystal Palace near London is already well on the way with site clearing and foundation work. On this spot will rise a 17-story building for accommodating the competing athletes and officials. The building materials during construction will mainly be handled by the Babcock Bites crane now being assembled. To overcome the difficulties of installing the crane on a restricted site and to simplify its erection, it's delivered in sections which are easily transported. After preparing the base, which is mounted on rails so that the crane can move over the site, the first section of the tower is placed on it, ready to be raised up. Once the tower is upright, the cage inside it is raised to the top. This cage contains the electric motors and the means to control them. Slowly but surely, the cage moves up, but it need not hold up the men who have started to assemble the jib. As the building climbs higher, the crane can be made taller by adding an extension and raising the cage inside it. As soon as the inner section has reached the required height for the start of the building work, and the men have completed the assembly of the first parts of the jib, the self-erecting mechanism is operated and the counterweight jib is raised within a matter of seconds. Ballast weights are placed on the travelling base to keep the crane stable under all conditions. Now the main jib is hoisted in position and anchored to the tower in preparation for the final lift. Erecting these tower cranes usually takes around five days, but with a foreman like Dave Steele, who has the job at his fingertips, it's possible to cut this time by quite a bit, and more so when the rain and mud keep away. All that remains to be done now is to operate the lifting mechanism, and the main jib will rise into its horizontal position in as little as 15 seconds. Then, it's just a question of fitting the key bolts and putting the crane through a thorough test before handing it over to the building contractor. Babcock and Wilcox have been making cranes for 50 years, mostly at Renfrew, but now the Dalmuir works have become the centre of crane manufacture and the new Babcock Weitz tower cranes have a section of the works to themselves. Before welding the steel members, there's a lot to be done. Here's Johnny McDougall, heating a section for shaping. Hot work, but a change from getting hot under the collar, watching his favourite sport, football. James Barron, his mate, prefers bird breeding. He says it's quieter. At the same time, Thomas Howe and his mate crop the bars to predetermined lengths and mark them up for systematic stocking for flow line production. Joshua Meehan can easily select the one needed and clamp it in position for the welders, James Calgan and namesake James Lockhart, to carry on with the actual welding of the members and transform them into jibs, towers and other sections of the tower crane. In the construction of modern multi-storey buildings and other large structures, large quantities of materials must be speedily raised to considerable heights and accurately placed in position over a wide area. Cranes and buildings like these are now inseparable. They are to be seen all over the country, speeding building and civil engineering projects, changing the skyline of our towns and cities. How would we manage without the ordinary, everyday pencil? Taken for granted, it often plays quite an important part in our lives. Here's Betty Reed of the stationery department at Babcock and Wilcox Renfrew, handing over a fresh supply. Does she give any thought to its importance in the daily round of the company's activities? 
Without drawings, the men in the works couldn't possibly carry out their jobs efficiently, if at all. Joe Wright of the drawing office is one of the many who produce the drawings from which the tracing and shop prints will be made. As he goes on quietly with his work, you'd hardly suspect that he'd have any reason to think of Betty Reed, or pencils, or the girls who will be tracing his drawings, such as Annette McInnes, just as meticulous with pen and ink as Joe is with pencil. Or Joan Nicol, or Janice Nisbet and Rita Lindsay. Well, away from the drawing board, they're all of them very much in his thoughts, and quite a few others. In the main buildings, busy with orders, invoices, statements and so on, we'll find Maureen McMahon, who doesn't seem to know the answer to Kathleen's query. But Anne Lockhead is the one who usually knows. All these young ladies probably give a thought or so to Joe Wright as well, because Joe happens to be their instructor in Scottish country dancing. Working under the one roof during the day, they meet in the evening under another to master the intricate steps of their national dances. Scottish country dancing isn't solo dancing or just dancing with a partner. It's a group effort and you need a good sense of timing, an ear for music and you must use your hands and carry yourself gracefully. Each dance is composed of a pattern of well-planned movements. Some of these movements crop up again in many of the dances. It doesn't matter how good an individual dancer you might be, it's the overall effect of unison that counts and that calls for team spirit. See how the hands are held at shoulder level. Hands are used mainly to help the other dancer. We're a bit down on our complement of lads at this rehearsal, but the lassies are managing quite well without them. Practice makes perfect, and perfect they'll have to be. It's one thing clipping the light fantastic in the club room when no one minds if you go wrong. But it's another thing when you file out to face a large audience and the butterflies begin to flap in your stomach as you get ready for the public performance on the annual sports day. This is the moment that matters as you face the provost and other important guests. The introductory bar of the music strikes up and it's best foot forward. As the music plays and the dancers dance, the sports events continue with determined rivalry. There were quite a few teams competing on the Babcock ground at Moorcroft Park. The weather was kind, so we had a good gait. Plenty of spectators to encourage the competitors and cheer them home. Provost Carruthers certainly had an enjoyable day for it was the Scottish country dancing that really held the stage and provided perhaps the most colourful display that afternoon. And we mustn't end without a word of praise for the Royal Scottish Country Dance Society which has done much to popularise Scotland's traditional tunes and dances.